Matthew chapter 5. Today we talk about blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Righteousness. And this is actually kind of a breath of fresh air. Last few weeks have been um, very heavy in the text. And seeking after righteousness can actually be very heavy too. However, there is a breath of fresh air to it. it. Is that there is absolute righteousness. We know what that is, and we know how to seek after it. That's actually quite a breath of fresh air. I, I met with um, I met with a kid yesterday, a young a young girl who um, really struggling with anxiety. Seems to be just keep coming up. Everyone I meet with, just over and over again. Um, really struggling with anxiety and um, not not a believer. This kid's not a believer, raised in the church, but has a very negative view of the church. And um, and she's telling me that she's struggling with anxiety. And so I looked at her and I was like, well, what do you stand on? What is morality? What's a moral good? And she goes, I don't know. And I was like, is it immoral to murder somebody? And she goes, I don't know. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? But she meant it. She meant that she didn't know. And she wasn't certain. And I was thinking about that. I was like, what? How would you not be anxious if your foundation is that unstable? Day to day, you don't know what you believe. You don't know what you stand on. That would be so unnerving. We know that there is real righteousness. We know that that is, um, the, uh, that is God. He is righteousness. And that whatever his will, whatever his path is the correct one because he made it all. He knows what's right. So there is real righteousness. We know the source of it. We have this foundation. And so in a sense, even though in order to seek after righteousness, there's the implied removal of sin, <laughs> which we've talked about, mourning over, over sin, being poor in spirit. These things have been addressed already. There's the implied removal of sin, and so therefore righteousness can be kind of a heavy topic, but the fact that we have a place to go to is just a breath of fresh air. Um, and so that's what I hope we get from today's message. It's really cool. Going through the Beatitudes, um, it's funny, uh, me and Mike go back and forth on, should we do an old chapter at a time? Should we be doing smaller chunks? Like, we, we switch it up all the time. Should we be doing the huge overview? Should we go in depth? And, um, and I love that we're actually just doing that all the time because it mixes it up. And there is something really special about slowing down and taking some time and living in a passage. And I was thinking about this, and I, I kind of saw this analogy. My brother-in-law is from England, my brother-in-law is from England, and what I realized from a traveler, and especially the problem with like a, um, a roaming traveler who's constantly traveling, is that they get to see everything, right? But they're not a part of any of it. So they see it, and then they're not actually a part of it. It doesn't change who they are. It might change their perspective on the world because they get to see it all, but unless they actually spend time living there, living in a place, they don't actually start to talk like the people, eat like the people, think like the people, right? It's kind of the problem that they have. I see this in my brother-in-law from England. When he first came over <laughs> from England, um, I don't know where he was at um, exactly, but very European, very English, very British, he had a very... European view of cow's milk. Ah, right, you're laughing because you're like, well, what's the difference? I know, that was my thought. <laughs> but he had his very European view of cow's milk, which is you get a glass bottle about this big like once a week. That's it. <laughs> now, my family, big family, five kids, both parents, uh, so seven people, lots of boxes of cereal. We had a very American view of cow's milk. At least two gallons in the fridge at all times. <laughs> and we'd go through them, you know? You never had to do the sniff test when I was a kid because you never ever got through two gallons before they went bad. <laughs> right, all right. So he, <laughs> he eating breakfast with us for one of the first times ever. Somebody says, hey, Craig, you want some milk with your breakfast? And he goes, sure, sure, if there's enough. And we're all like, what? And my brother pulls a gallon out of the fridge. He goes, yeah, I think there's enough. <laughs> and Craig looks over, and I don't think he would have had a, a more surprised reaction if he had pulled a polar bear out of the fridge. <laughs> like, 
whoa, <laughs> holy milk. <laughs> like, you guys do got milk. He went to the extreme. Like, you got a lot of milk. You could be a commercial. He was shocked. Like, it was so foreign to him. Now, lives in the States, and got four, I think. <laughs> I should know this. My only sister. Uh, <laughs> four kids. And um, now he has a very American view of milk. <laughs> he doesn't see milk the same way he used to. Cow's milk is now a gallon in the fridge. Changed him. Literally changed him. Why? Because he spent time and he experienced it. And so this is the really cool thing we got to do when we're taking time to break down these Beatitudes is we're actually taking time with the Beatitude, meditating on the Beatitude to let it change us, actually change us. And we talk about this all the time in sermons and Bible study groups about are we hearing the word or are we actually doing it too? Like, does it actually change us? Well, I think when we slow down like this, this is a very prime opportunity for us to actually dwell on this and let it change us. Travel is true in God's word as well. We can travel through it, see it all. You've always, everybody's heard that one atheist who's like, I read the Bible, but it didn't change them. It didn't experience it. Now, we've all heard, read, and believe things like tame the tongue and control the whole body, like in James 3, right? But how many of us have perfect control over the tongue? Probably not many. Sometimes it takes time meditating on it. So today we're going to wrap up the first set of Beatitudes. What do I mean by that? They're kind of broken up into sections. Uh, it wasn't obvious to me until I started diving in deeper, and Mike mentioned it, so I took a closer look. The first set of Beatitudes are very much our relationship to God, and it has very to do, you know, the um, lowly of spirit, the, or um, poor in spirit, the mournful, that's mournful over sin, um, and um, uh, humility. These are things before the Lord, meek before God. Um, and now we're finally wrapping that up with those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Well, again, that's, that's a God thing. The next set of Beatitudes is going to be more towards relationship between us and man. But we get to wrap up this section. And as I looked at them, what I think I'm, I'm hopefully going to be able to show today, which I'm really excited about because it's a pattern I never noticed before, each of these Beatitudes build on each other. And one without the other doesn't accomplish the same response. That response is what we're going to talk about today, which is that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And it's real. It's a real hunger and thirst. It's not a, it's not an, um, a put on show or something we drum up. It comes from within naturally when we proceed it with the first Beatitudes that Jesus gave. And I'll show what that means as we go. But the goal of these Beatitudes is to bring us to a full reliance on God's grace. Which brings me to my first quote this morning from a very, very great book called Lead by Paul Tripp that me and Mike have been reading together. You've probably seen the slide up there. This is what we've been going through week after week. One of my favorite quotes in there, and it's very simple. It's not earth shattering, but it's such a clean reminder is that every leader leads while being in desperate need of the full resources of God's grace. Paul Tripp. Every leader. Who's every leader? Everybody who has to lead at some point in their life, which is everybody, especially if you're a parent. Everybody leads. And we're to do that from a um, lowly place, recognizing that we are reliant fully on the complete grace of God. Let's dive into our text. I actually want to read all the Beatitudes because, again, I'm coming at this with the mindset that it's a runway up to hungering and thirsting after righteousness. So in Matthew 5, starting verse 3, reads like this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will not might, they will be filled. Now, it's important to notice the descriptive words he used here, um, and I'm not going to go too crazy into them, but I think it's interesting that he said hunger and thirst. You notice that. Two descriptives. Most of the attitudes, just one. This time, he's like, I'm going to give you two descriptives, hunger and thirst. I don't want to go too much into it, but I think it's interesting if you think about what hunger is and what thirst is. 
Think about the human body. How often do you need water? All the time. Especially in the Middle East where they're at, you go a day without water, you are dehydrated immediately. Now what about food? You can go a day or two without food. You can't go a lifetime without food, and you can't get strong off water. So he's covering two aspects of a physical need here, the daily desperate need and the need to be in uh, consuming food over a long period of time in order to build strength. That's where your protein comes from. That's where your energy comes from. That's where fat comes from. All of that, all that energy that we need. So it's showing two biological needs, an immediate desperate need and a long-term strengthening need. It is giving the sense of a really strong desire. Very human, basic human instinct. In fact, if you ask scientists what the, um, what the levels of basic human instinct are, most of them will go straight to food. Food or water. Well, they said water, then food, then shelter. They'll go on and on. It's a very human, basic instinct, right? So I think it's important that he says that. Again, the idea of it was not to get too spiritualized on it, but to just show how great this desire is to be. It should be very natural, instinctual, and strong. Necessity. In simple English, this passage is saying, people are happy when they strongly desire after righteousness. Right? So righteous what? Righteous acts? There are many passages that talk about righteousness. What is he talking about here? Well, I don't think it's just simply righteous acts especially if you look at Matthew 5, 21 through 22, because Jesus, just further down in the passage, Jesus didn't come to change just our actions, right? He came to change our hearts. He says, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. Jesus came to change hearts, not just actions. He wanted to start with the heart, and then from the heart, out comes actions. That was his goal. I want to change the source. I want to change the source of everything you do. I want to change your heart. It's not legalism. It's truth. It's reality lived out through us. So the righteousness he's talking about here, in context with Jesus' teaching, goes deeper than just simply acting righteous, although that matters. He wants our hearts to desire after righteousness. And notice the cool thing about it, if you think about it, it's um, the implied removal of sin is already there. So this focus, this focus he's giving us is uh, more in the positive of just simply, you're blessed when you are you're happy when you are seeking after righteousness. That's just, it's just a true statement, right? It's just a true statement. He says, when you are seeking after righteousness, you are naturally blessed and happy. This is all part of justification, or uh, not, not part of justification, sorry, part of sanctification. Justification happens once for all. We accept the Lord into our heart. We are cleaned and cleansed once for all. But sanctification doesn't just happen immediately. Sanctification is a lifelong effort. We read passages that talk about we are redeemed from glory to glory, right? So we have our uh, justification through Jesus on the cross, but we are still sinful humans who sometimes don't seek after righteousness like we should. Romans 6, 12 through 14 says this, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its, obey its desires, and do not suffer any part, uh, parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. Paul agrees Scripture agrees with itself, in this case, Paul agreeing with what Jesus said. He's saying we are to seek after righteousness, not unrighteousness. We are to make our lives weapons for righteousness rather than unrighteousness. Not allowing sin to cause us to be a weapon for the enemy in this world. I think there are large portions of our Christian lives, and I think this is something that probably every believer goes through, 
um, at least I hope so, because I do, where we don't necessarily hunger and thirst for righteousness. If it's this great desire, this strong desire, you know, people like to talk about the, the when you first got saved, there was that sort of crazy high of, a, I want I want all righteousness. I want to read the whole Bible. I want to go to Bible college. Like, there's this crazy explosion of joy. And there's a very clear hunger and desire for righteousness. A lot of times, that's what originally drove somebody to Jesus in the first place, was that hunger for, I want something that's right and real in this place. But then, life is a grind. And I think there are periods and patches in just about every Christian's life, probably every Christian's life, where that hunger just doesn't seem that strong. That thirst just doesn't seem that strong. This happens, I believe. And I don't mean that we are opposed in our mind to righteousness. It's not like we stop believing that righteousness matters. It's just that we don't feel it in that sense. There isn't always that strong desire after it. And I think that Jesus' sermon here is going to show us why and what we need to do to get back to that desire. What we need to do to get back to that seeking, that thirst, that hunger. It actually came to me as I was studying um, for this Sunday. Sunday sermons are never easy for me. Um, they're very stressful for me. In fact, pretty much every time Saturday is rolling around, um, I start to stress out, thinking that I'm not going to have anything to say. <laughs> like, I've got the text. I've got the line out. I understand what he's saying. I can just give facts. I can pull up, throw up some nice graphs, whatever, or okay graphs, whatever. I can throw some information on the screen. <laughs> but I was called to preach. Not just simply to put the information out there. There are those who are called to do that. Uh, I was called to preach, so I stress about this. Like last minute, like, man, these people giving up a part of their day to come listen to me drone on. Like, this is horror. Like, every Saturday night, every time, this is how I feel. <laughs> and then, very last minute, God gives me something. Just like that. Very last minute. And I do mean last freaking minute. To the point where I lose sleep putting it down because I'm up till 2 a.m. Saturday, Sunday morning. <laughs> and I used to think this problem was bad planning on my part because this is the thing about me. I'm a millennial, just not good at planning. <laughs> Mike's laughing because he's a Gen X and he's so good at planning. <laughs> it's something that, like, you know, I laugh about it, but it's actually like thing I've had to change in my life that fortunately Mike, Mike comes alongside me and, and bolsters in me and, and, um, in ways that I wouldn't, you know, God uses them in a way because I'm not capable of doing that myself. Learning how to plan better. So I actually used to think, man, I bet Mike just feels great on Thursday. You know, so I was super encouraged last week when he's like, yeah, I felt like crap until the last second. I thought, like, God, give me something. I was like, I totally agree with that. Thank you. Relatability with my own pastor. This a <laughs> super occurs to me. Um, but then this past week, I, my plans were perfect. I had Mike cover me on Wednesday, so I was free all week to study. I had everything mapped out. I had everything written down, and I still felt like I had nothing. I was like, planning didn't work, Gen X. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I had everything planned out and it still happened Saturday night still like what am I going to say my reaction by the way was something like when I was a young child like why does it always you know use those extremes there's, there's no in between always have to be this way never this always that that was my attitude why does it have to be so hard every single time and then God reminded me of something. He specifically reminded me, what would you be doing if you weren't seeking after me? Sin. Sin. When I'm not seeking after the Lord, I break so fast. So fast. I don't know if you guys experienced this. And so there have been periods in my life where I didn't even think I was breaking. You know, I wasn't even aware of how gross my life was. So fast, and he reminded me of that, and I was like, oh, man, that's what ease gets me. That's what ease gets me when I'm not striving after the word, when I'm not striving after the Lord and for something to just say on a Sunday. 
I'm not actually seeking after his righteous. I don't have that hunger and thirst for his righteousness. He's like David. Think about David with Bathsheba. And God sends a messenger to him. Uh, excuse me, David. Someone broke this important thing. And he's like, oh, no. They should pay for it. And the messenger was like, you broke it, David. Oh. Oh, no. You're so right. Crap. I don't know if they said crap back then. Oh, okay, it's in the Hebrew. Mike said. <laughs> but you think about how gracious it is God for God to do this. Because what did it do to David? What did it do? It broke him. That moment brought David right back, right back to the Beatitudes. Jesus hadn't even preached him yet. And it brought David right back to him in a real, real way because he remembered in that moment how poor of spirit he is. And because he remembered how poor in spirit he is, it caused him to be mournful over his sin. And because he was mournful over his sin, he was humbled. All of that brought him back to the place that he should be in, which was that hunger and thirst for righteousness. He once again desired to go back after righteousness. He hated what had happened. Literally murdered Uriah. This produced a real, not fake, not drummed up, a real natural hunger back in David's heart. God could have just struck him dead. God could have just taken him out. And to be fair, a lot of people who are given this opportunity stop at one of these steps and fall right into legalism, right into explaining themselves, self-justification, self-righteousness. A lot of people will stop at one of these steps. They won't get past poor in spirit, or they won't get past mourning after their, over their sin, or they won't get past humility. And they'll explain it all away somehow, and they'll fall right into legalism. This robs us of our appetite for righteousness. I think even the strongest believers find themselves at times lacking in an appetite for righteousness, that desire. It's because they forget how poor in spirit they, it's because we forget how poor in spirit we are. Sometimes we just feel like we're doing so good. We forget the only reason why there's joy in our lives is because of what Jesus did for us. It's nothing we did. It's not like it all of a sudden changed. God's outside of time. He sees it all. It's not like, oh, now you're great <laughs> of your own will. Good job. It's like, no, you're here because I redeemed you. We have to go back to that and remember that. Looking at this order in the negative, this order of beatitudes in the negative, um, it shows us how easy it is to fall into that legalism. And I'll explain it. I'll throw up a graph on the screen for you. Here's the order in reverse. Forgetting not in reverse, really, but in the negative. Forgetting how poor in spirit we are makes us less mournful about sin. Because if we don't understand our need for a Savior, sin won't really bother us. Okay? So forgetting how poor in spirit we are makes us less mournful about sin. Being less mournful about sin makes us less humble. If our sin doesn't seem so bad, we're going to be aggressive towards anyone that disagrees. Self-righteous. Being less humble leaves us with no reason to hunger after righteousness. Why hunger after something if we are already full? You see that order. Anywhere you stop in that breakdown, you're starting to justify yourself. You're starting to feel pretty good about yourself, and you're forgetting that there's this huge gap between you and Jesus. Massive gap. That gap was filled with a cross. Not us. That was filled with a cross. And at no point did we ever add anything in that gap to hold that gap up. If you look at what this really does, forgetting these things makes our heart less like that of Christ, which makes our thoughts less like that of Christ, which finally makes our actions less like that of Christ. 
if in a real way your heart is less like Christ, then you're going to think less about the way Christ does things. And if you're thinking about it less, you're going to do it less. Starts at the heart, moves out. We end up with that self-righteous righteous attitude based in legalism, which we're going to find in Luke. And I'm actually going to have everybody turn with me because we're going to do a sizable chunk here. We're going to look at a parable to finish this off, to show a, a, in a very real way um, exactly how this plays out, according to Jesus in Luke 18. So find Luke 18. This is a parable, a very famous parable. I mean, they're all famous, right? There's no parable where, someone, where most Christians are going to be like, I've never heard that before. No, we've all, we know Jesus' parables. Uh, but this is the the classic one uh, with the two men. The, you got the the tax collector. You got the Pharisee. They're sitting there. This is about self righteousness, and it clearly shows the breakdown in this row of beatitudes. And it's really really cool. Um, Lord gave me this while I was in the office, and I told Mike, and I was super excited. And Mike gives me a big thumbs up. He doesn't really know what I'm talking about. But, like, he's excited that I'm excited, so he's encouraging. <laughs> it's like, that's awesome, dude. <laughs> no, it's not really that way. This guy encourages me every time. Luke 18, we're going to start in verse 9. Your, pa- your Bible might even label this something about, um, I don't remember what mine labeled it, something about a um, um, this self-righteous person looking down on the the, the lower person. It's all about bitterness and and thinking highly of yourself. He also told this parable, he meaning Jesus, of course, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, trusted in themselves that they were righteous, self-righteous, and looked down on everyone else. I love that Jesus was so blunt (laughs) with a whole bunch of Pharisees in the room. It's crazy. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Actually, I, I got to back up. I didn't look at the context of this parable. There might not have been Pharisees in the room. I don't know if he was talking to his disciples or what. But anyways, he would say things like this in front of Pharisees. He wasn't afraid. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. Okay, Pharisee, praying about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like that like this tax collector. The first time I read this when I was younger um, was such a hard slap in the face because I actually had prayed as a younger man um, just thanking the Lord uh, that he had put me in a Christian family and that I wasn't, I wasn't raised the way those sinners were in the public schools. I was homeschooled. I just offended 90% of the room. I'm sorry. I was a jerk. I get it. Uh, That's the point of the story. I would actually read this before and actually had thought that before. I'd actually pray like, wow, thank Lord for not making me like all those chumps. I'm serious. Pharisaical belief in my heart has been there. And we'll come right back in if we're not seeking after righteousness. So, Like this tax collector, he said, verse 12, I fast twice a week. (laughs) I got that from you. (laughs) I give a tenth of everything I get, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this one went down to his house justified, rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And we saw this with David. I saw this with myself when I read this. God humbled me. God humbled David. And that's by his grace that he does that. That's that whole run-up of of the Beatitudes, of being mournful in spirit. This Pharisee was not mournful in spirit or a lowly in spirit, sorry, at all. He considered himself to be very wealthy in spirit. What a great spirit I have. All right. I'm great. That's how he felt. I don't sin. He wasn't mournful over sin. He didn't even think he was doing it. Look at all these great things I do. He was not meek at all. 
he spent his time in prayer glorifying himself and looking down on this nasty little tax collector. How gross. He didn't just miss one of the Beatitudes. He started at the beginning and said, I'll throw them all out, and I'll just be righteous on my own. The order of these Beatitudes, I believe Jesus put in here intentionally. They absolutely lead one to the next. If we can't bring ourselves, and by the way, if you're joining this series for the first time, or you missed any of the weeks, I really encourage you to go back and listen to the Beatitudes as Mike broke them down, um, either through our website in a podcast form, or um, YouTube, Facebook, it's out there. I think our, our podcasts are on like Spotify and stuff too, aren't they? Apple Podcasts. I know they're on Google Podcasts because I use them there. So different podcast sites, you can listen to these in order if you haven't heard these yet, because Mike breaks down what it means to be poor in spirit. And if we don't start there, understanding how poor we are in spirit, then we're not going to be mournful over sin, which is the second one Mike preached on. And if we don't get to being mournful in sin over our sin, then we're not going to be humble. That was the third one. And if we don't, if we aren't humble before the Lord, meek before the Lord, then we're not going to seek after righteousness. We're not going to desire after it. You're not going to have a natural craving for it. You might be a Pharisee and do righteous acts, but your heart will not be changed. If we don't take time intentionally in this area to look at what it means to be poor in spirit, to realize how low we are compared to God and his greatness, and to go through these steps and recognize the truth of these, our hearts won't be changed. And we won't be seeking after righteousness with a hunger and a thirst that is real and natural. I encourage you guys to do that this week. Spend some real time focusing in on this. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that um, you bring us reminders. I thank you that um, you came to us and made yourself relatable to us. Um, I can't even understand how that works. I have a hard time relating with people two generations below or above me. And you came to a world that is, um, that's filled with us, rotten sinners. I thank you that, that you chose to do that, that you're big enough, you're great enough um, to relate to us when we had no, no reason to even stand in your presence. I thank you what you've been doing through um, through our hearts as a as a body as we've been looking at um, at Jesus, Jesus your sermon the sermon you gave us that you thought to put those down those words down for us and that we could be here understanding our, our desperate need for you our desperate need for your redeeming grace I pray just that you would continue to um, reveal that to our hearts that we would continue to be reminded and go back to understanding. Uh, that it's all about you, that all of our righteousness comes nothing from ourselves. Uh, we have no, um, no basis for legalism, Lord. It's all on you. It's your grace. We ask you to continue to work in our hearts and to continue to draw ourselves to you because, Lord, we want to be more like you. We want to be more like Jesus who laid his own life down for us. We praise and we worship you with honest hearts as we, as we realize who we are. We can honestly say, um, glory to your name, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. We worship you. Be honored by our words. We ask this in your name. Amen.